So, as anyone who hasn't been living under a rock uh, for the last couple of months should know at this point, Spider-Man Far From Home dropped here in the U.S. on Tuesday the 2nd of July, either so that they could uh, set a new Tuesday box office record or just so they wouldn't have to compete directly with the 4th of July holiday weekend, since that's a a uh, weekend that people like to have house parties on rather than go to the movies. Or, you know, I think it might just be a combination of the two. And it made it a little awkward to get to see the movie opening day. I ended up seeing it the day after, avoiding spoilers, thankfully, and was even able to theorize a couple of things which turned out to be true as of the end credits sequences. At least there are two of them. Uh, one at the mid-credits and one at the end, and you should stay for both. And I just really briefly wanted to talk about the movie. I liked it a lot. I thought it was a fantastic Spider-Man movie. Tom Holland just keeps getting better in the role. He's really finding his groove and like he was in a pretty good groove as Peter Parker. His first scene as the character uh, back in Captain America Civil War. So the fact that he's still finding his groove, he's still improving as this character I think really says something about his abilities as an actor. The supporting cast uh, was great. Zendaya in particular, I thought, was absolutely fantastic in this movie. She kind of reminds me, of all characters, of the love interest in a Goofy movie. When we first meet that character, we see her uh, through the lead's uh, point of view, and she seems like that perfect epitome of a high school crush that you see in high school movies all the time and she seems cool and collected all the time but then as the movie goes on you see her in more vulnerable positions you see more nuances to her character and you realize she's just as much a layered person as the lead is and that's how Zendaya's version of MJ felt in this movie uh, working on the assumption that you have seen the trailers for this movie Happy Hogan was in this as a character this does take place after Avengers Endgame and the I guess spoiler alert <laughs> death of Tony Stark aka Iron Man and because he was such a big name and because he was sort of the face of the Avengers anyway and because he then gave his life to save half the population of the universe at least as far as the average person and knows most of them not realizing that Thanos was gonna kill all of us by the end Tony is elevated beyond hero status to something else. He's revered and he's honored constantly throughout this movie. There are memorial shrines to him on the sides of streets and, and giant murals of him up on buildings. One of the earliest scenes in the movie is actually in part a tribute to him and, and it demonstrates something that I think this movie does really well is it manages to be kind of a dark comedy. The tone in this movie never gets super heavy except in specific moments where it needs to be super heavy. The rest of the time it's kind of a comedy. Even in darker situations, which I think is on purpose, because the MCU version of MJ, played by Zendaya as I mentioned before, is very dark comedy. That's that's her thing. And so I think to accentuate her character, the movie decided to go with you know, the writers on the movie or somebody involved in the movie decided to go with a tone that she would appreciate. And so this very early scene, this memorial to Tony, ends up being absolutely hysterical while also simultaneously feeling real and genuine and kind of touching and giving genuine insight into how at least characters roughly the age of uh, Peter in this world are dealing with this great loss. Not only that, but again, this was in the trailers, the world is looking for the next Iron Man. Iron Man did so much to advance things so much in such a short period of time. Now everybody is going to wonder who's going to fill that void. And I mean also, uh, who is going to take up the mantle of a hero of that caliber? Someone who is just as willing and just as able uh, to risk their life for everyone else. Like Tony may have failed to wrap the world in armor, but he still served as the world's 
shield in his armor. And people in this universe are worrying now that there isn't anybody like that anymore, especially now that Captain America is also uh, no longer capable of doing the Captain America thing. There are people in this movie who are genuinely worried that the Avengers as an organization just don't exist anymore. And can you imagine how terrifying that must be? These people just popped back into existence after five years, or knew a bunch of people who popped back into existence after five years, and then there was a massive fight between an army of heroes and an alien army. That would be terrifying enough if that fight between those two armies hadn't also cost the world one of its greatest and most dedicated heroes. And so Peter is being pressured from multiple directions to do more as Spider-Man, up to and including some people expecting him to pick up Tony's slack. And he doesn't want that. He's not ready for that, or at least he feels like he's not ready for that. By the end of the movie, he proves that he is. And then Mysterio comes along, and anyone who knows Spider-Man uh, lore and mythos knows that Mysterio is a bad guy, but until we find that out in the movie, it's really easy to get swept up in Peter hoping that this character is genuine and wanting him to be that hero because it really seems like he'd do a damn good job of it. And I think the most interesting thing is to come out of this are that, one, Tony is still a prominent character in this movie. He even gets a couple of quips off. There are aspects of his sense of humor and his unique personality which still make their way into this movie, even though he's dead. And yet his presence never really feels like it overshadows Peter's story. Like, I can't imagine how delicate that balancing act must have been. And then the scenes, which I'm sure everyone realized were going to be here, where Peter does feel a lot like a young Tony Stark. Uh, coming into his own, we're genuinely moving. And what's most interesting about them, and I guess this is sort of a minor spoiler, so I apologize, is that the people around Peter realize this, but he's just so swept up in trying to do the right thing that he doesn't even see it. If there's one thing about this movie that I don't entirely like, and this is going to necessitate some spoilers for me to talk about, so if you don't want spoilers, just know that I really like this movie. I'm rating it super high, and I think it was better than Spider-Man Homecoming as a Spider-Man movie by a landslide. And I do think you should see it. But for the rest of you, let's talk about Edith. Now I'm gonna wait a few seconds to make sure that everybody who doesn't want to hear more than that can leave. Okay. Edith is the glasses that Tony left for Peter that we saw in a bunch of the trailers. They are, as the trailers and didn't even suggest, it flat out told us, they're tech. They're a connection to Stark tech left over from after Tony died. And Tony was smart enough to not only anticipate that they would manage to bring Peter and the others back, but also intelligent enough to anticipate that the reason that Strange kept him alive back at the end of Infinity War was because he might need to die during that last big confrontation with Thanos. Like, it never explicitly says that anywhere, but we can infer that that's the case, because very clearly Tony left instructions for these Edith glasses to be delivered to Peter should he die, which necessitates him both thinking that he might die, and also being reasonably sure that Peter is going to be alive when he does. And I could buy that Tony Stark is the kind of person who would be simultaneously smart enough, hopeful enough, and also pessimistic enough uh, to believe that that exact set of circumstances would come to pass. And Edith is literally the name of the AI programmed in these glasses, which controls these drones, which launch from a satellite in orbit, and they have weapons on board, but they're not strictly weapon drones. They're clearly made to suppress severe threats. Like, I've seen people drawing comparisons between them and the um, computer-controlled helicarriers from Winter Soldier, and they're not the same thing. Like, I still think that Tony maybe shouldn't have made them. They're pretty dangerous, but they're not the same thing. And we're talking about Tony Stark here. We're talking about a guy who designed Jarvis, who was 
I would say a lot. He could make choices above and beyond his programming, and I think that if Tony had tried to do something really horrible, he would have argued against it, you know? And all of Tony's other AIs, they all seem to be at least that intelligent or advanced, right? Like Friday, functionally speaking, the AI that replaced Jarvis when Jarvis became Vision, didn't seem any less sophisticated or less intelligent than Jarvis, and yet the Edith AI on these glasses is stupid enough to let Peter accidentally almost kill one of his classmates, and then later stupid enough to let the villain take advantage of all of those drones for his own purposes. And I don't buy that the super weapon that Tony left to a kid, no matter how much he trusts that kid, wouldn't be advanced enough to know that attacking large populations of civilians is a bad thing and that that shouldn't be done. But if we assume that that near miss earlier on it was just a glitch, something that wouldn't have been repeated, and then we assume later that Mysterio's guys like straight up reprogrammed Edith to make it so she would follow their commands no matter how horrible they were, it still works. It's just, it's still kind of annoying. It's out of character for Tony is what I'm saying. But the rest of the movie was dramatic enough, compelling enough, well acted enough, funny enough, action packed enough, the effects were good enough, and the final fight where Peter finally comes into his own as Spider-Man, again, because he kind of did that at the end Homecoming too, but you know what I mean, was spectacular enough that I can accept a contrivance like Edith if it drives this movie forward, and it certainly did that. There are other elements I could talk about. I could talk about Nick Fury in this movie. I could talk about uh, Ned Leeds or how even though a decent chunk of this movie focused on like teenage drama stuff, it never felt like it detracted from anything. It never felt like those moments dragged. But I don't really feel like I need to. This is a really solid Spider-Man movie. It's up there with Spider-Man 2, I think, as the best of the franchise. Franchises. So far, if you are a Marvel fan who just wants uh, further lore, this is sort of a denouement to Endgame anyway. Or if you're a Spider-Man fan who wants more good Spider-Man content, this is definitely a movie you should see. Though if you're not already an MCU fan or a Spider-Man movie fan, this one's not going to change your mind. So if you fall into that increasingly small niche... I would just skip it. All of that said, though, guys, as per usual, I'd like to know what do you guys think of Spider-Man Far From Home. If you didn't see it, please, if you're going to put spoilers in your comments, put them below. Uh, keep reading tags, if you please. If not, I will delete your comments. But yeah, let's get a discussion in the comment section down below or over my Discord link in the description. But either way, this has been AJ22, and I will talk to you guys later.